we're going through Ruth, as I said a little bit ago. And uh, Ruth is an interesting book. I'll ex- uh, my history with the book when I was younger, I always thought it was a girly book. I want to read about romance and love. And, ugh, I don't want that. I'm a boy. I want tough combat action. I was always drawn to 1 Samuel through 2 Chronicles, all the bloodshed and gory details. But when I was in seminary, in my journey to learn Hebrew, I had to translate the entire book of Ruth, cover to cover. And I discovered something pretty interesting about it. Ruth is amazing. This is an awesome, amazing book that I should have spent way more time on as a kid, considering, as I said a little bit ago, the whole theme of Ruth is God's provision which is like the thing about God that I've always appreciated the most. It's why I usually refer to God as Lord. The big capital Lord that you see in the Old Testament, uh, which is Yahweh, the name of God, I am. I am the God of provision who will come to rescue Israel from Egypt. I am the God who is. And so provision has always been something that I have been very attuned to, yet... In all of my childhood, until I got to seminary, I never realized this book is dripping with irony about God's provision. And I don't mean that as in God's provision is ironic, but as you will see, chapter 2's God's provision comes through. Ruth is told by her mother-in-law to go to a field and pluck grain. Ruth, as we will cover in the book, drives into your head as a Moabitess in Israel who hates Moabites. And yet she is to go and pick grain, which God commanded that the foreigner, stranger, widow, poor, go behind the shearers of grain and pick up what falls. They were not to go back and collect everything, but to leave what falls for those in need. Ruth fits this, yet the risk to Ruth being a young woman from a foreign land that no one cares about, you can imagine a bunch of men in a field tired and there's a pretty lady there. I don't need to go into details. And the Bible describes Ruth going to Boaz's field as it just happens by sheer luck, just by chance. And we know that can't be the case. And so all throughout script, all throughout this book, you will see God's direct providence is only mentioned a couple of times. Otherwise, God shows up in the mundane, boring, ordinary life in ways that we might overlook, but is God providing? So without further ado, let's read. We're going to go chapter by chapter every week. So we've got all of chapter 1. And so I'm going to read it all for us. It's a little longer than normal, but it's easy to follow, so it shouldn't be too bad. Ruth, chapter 1, it's right bef- after Judges and right before First Samuel. It's very short, so you might skip past it several times like I did this morning trying to mark it. <laughs> Literally knew where it was, and I just kept going past it. It was awful. Ruth chapter 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephraites from Bethlehem in Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there for about ten years, both Malon and Kilion died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab, that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughter-in-laws prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. 
why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, Naomi said, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Ruth opens on unprecedented suffering. You cannot imagine in ancient days a darker situation for Naomi. Having no husband in your life in that day meant you had no income, no way to protect yourself, no one who could take care of you, no one who could uh, provide. Now, it wouldn't have been so bad. Elimelech dying would have been a tragedy, but if her sons had stayed alive, her, her lineage would have carried on. She could have been taken care of by her sons. But even they die. Melon and Kilion and Elimelech all die. They all cease to live. And that leaves a widow and her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. This is the opening. The first five verses expresses unparalleled suffering. There are a couple of interesting things I want to point out in this first section before we jump too far into the meat of the text. The, the, really, the story begins in verse 6. Verse 1 to 5 is all introductory. First, it's in the days when the judges ruled. There was famine in the land. So famine, being in the land, is an interesting idea. But the thing I want to focus on is, is in the days when the judges ruled. Now, I've mentioned this a couple of times when we've talked about the Old Testament stories. But the days of the judges for Israel were not great. See, they had no central authority. They did not have a king yet. And so judges would rule various regions or various groups of people and they would lead them in holiness and righteousness. But the book of Judges describes a cycle. Israel would fall into sin, starting at the top of the cycle, where they would sin against God and live as in each man in their own way, in their own eyes. They would live according to how they felt best. This would cause God to lead punishment on the judges. And so they would, he would bring in a foreign land or famine or some other punishment on the people to bring them back to their attention, they would suffer as a result. They would cry out to God, and God would send them a judge, a rescuer, a prophet, essentially, who would usually lead some sort of armed conflict against whatever a foreign nation is invading. And then the people would repent, and for a time would live righteously according to God before the cycle would continue. And it is a never-ending cycle. And so when the author of Ruth says that all this takes place in the days of the judges, you have to think of almost chaos. The tribes of Israel are not working together. They're doing their own thing, each person living according to how they think is best. And I don't know about you, but humans aren't good at that. We needed Jesus, after all, because we couldn't get it right the first time on our own. And so there's a famine in the land. Now, 
This famine could be tied to God's punishment. It could be a natural phenomena. We don't know. However, this is actually the first instance of God's provision. Because I need you to think ahead with me to where the book ends. I'll spoil it if you haven't read Ruth. Ruth gets married, rescues Naomi from her deep despair. And her lineage, her direct lineage leads to King David, which leads to Jesus. If you look in the genealogy of Matthew, one of my favorite elements in Matthew is that both Ruth and Rahab the prostitute are mentioned by name as belonging to the lineage of Jesus Christ. So a sinner, a prostitute, and a foreigner are a part of Jesus' lineage. It's, it's crazy to think about, but a famine drives... Elimelech and Naomi and her sons from Bethlehem to Moab because God's got a plan for a young woman there named Ruth. This is God's first act of provision, and it's bottled up in suffering. I've talked about suffering before. The first sermon I did here as your official pastor, I took you to Romans chapter 5, and Paul encourages us to look at suffering differently than how the world would. We rejoice in our sufferings because suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And that hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. We as Christians are supposed to view suffering differently. And in this case, in Ruth, we should do the same thing with famine and with death. As deep suffering and tragedy as Elimelech, Naomi, Mahan, Kilion, Orpah, and Ruth go through, God is doing something behind the scenes that he's not even attributed, but will lead to the ultimate blessing, Jesus. That's the setup. That's where we are. That's where we're going. But before that, we have a conversation. Most of Ruth is actually a series of conversations. It makes for a great stage play. If you didn't want to do a lot of acting, just like dramatic reading, it would be fantastic for that because you could tell the whole story through dialogue. You wouldn't have to change that much. But starting in verse 6, Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people. This is the first time, one of the few, that God is directly attributed for his provision. He came to the aid of his people by providing food for them. There's an irony that uh, Naomi had to flee Bethlehem, which translates literally to house of bread, because there was no bread. And now, in Moab, a foreign land, they hear the house of bread has bread again. And in fact, you'll, find, you'll hear at the end of this chapter, they come back in the barley harvest season. So they're literally about to get more bread. God's provision shows up for his people. This is about ten years after they left. And they set out to return home. But Naomi takes a moment to dissuade her daughter-in-laws and says, go home. Go back to your mother's household, which is an interesting statement. It should be fathers, but Naomi is hopeful that God will show kindness to them and they will get married again. So go home to your mother's household, find another husband, may God bless that. And this is another of the major themes in this book. May the Lord show you kindness. This is verse 8 of chapter 1 in Ruth. May the Lord show you kindness. Now the word kindness in Hebrew is, a, is the Hebrew word chesed. I won't make you repeat it. I won't spell it out. But chesed is a word we can't really translate to English well. Because it captures this really big thing. We say kindness, but it's also mercy and grace and provision and love and forgiveness it's this deep, compassionate grace that God bestows upon his people. Naomi, in this conversation with Orpah and Ruth, is saying, may the Lord, it's a blessing. You can almost say, I know the Lord, or I trust the Lord, will bless you with this deep, rich kindness. And she says, she goes on, as you have shown kindness, it's the same word in Hebrew, chesed, this love, this compassion, to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you find rest in the home of another husband. So Naomi's first conversation with her daughter-in-laws 
is to encourage them to go back. And it's full of kindness and optimism, something Naomi doesn't have, right? We know where this is going. We know how she changes her name. But right now, she's trying to sell her daughters to go home. And there's a really kind of depressing reason for this. I've mentioned chapter 2 and this chance of just happening to end up at Boaz's field, but having no chance of another husband or more sons and foreigners in a land of people who hate you would not be safe for Ruth or Orpah. And Naomi can't protect them. As a widow, she has no power or ability to provide or protect for her daughter-in-laws. In in essence, and she'll say this the second time, when they both refuse, when they say, we'll go back with your people, she continues, return home, my daughters. This is verse 11 now. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. Notice how she's turned from, I hope, I know, I'm confident God will take care of you, but don't come with me because he's certainly not taking care of me. Do you hear this dichotomy, this change in tone in the complete faithlessness of Naomi? And you can sense that too in chapter 1, this introduction, when there's a famine in the land, They flee Israel, the promised land where they're meant to live, in their home village, to go to a foreign country. Now, we would say that's smart, and certainly the author makes no real comment on whether or not this is good or bad, but there's certainly this element of of, of fear and flight and trying to take care of themselves. And now in this uh, paragraph of verse 11, her second plea for her daughter-in-laws to go home, she, she's turned it from, may God bless you, to he's not taking care of me. And if you come with me, you will not be taken care of. It is foolish for you to come. It is stupid for you to come. It's such an interesting conversation that is happening here in chapter 1. And at this, Orpah leaves. She kisses her mother-in-law goodbye and leaves. Again, the author actually makes no comment on whether or not Orpah's decision was good or bad. The closest we get is when Ruth stays, Naomi says, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. This is the closest to a negative that we get on Orpah's decision. But the author is taking a very neutral stance to every character in this book because he's trying to paint this idea that God is providing through, in this chapter, it is through human decisions. It is through human decisions that God is providing, with the exception of returning food to Bethlehem. Human decisions drive this entire chapter, and all of God's provision happens as a result of the decisions that people make in this chapter. And so Naomi tells Ruth, who's stayed, who's clinging to her. Just picture the scene, right? They've walked a ways. I imagine they've walked almost to the border of Israel and Moab. When Naomi stops and says, I've been thinking for a while. Let's break the silence. Go home. There's nothing for you where I'm going but death and despair and misery. May God bless you, but he's not going to bless me, so don't come. Go home. And Orpah's convinced. She goes home. But she has a better chance going back to her parents' household and finding another husband than hoping for the long shot. Hoping for the long shot of finding a husband in Israel. Which shouldn't happen. It shouldn't happen for a foreigner. Ruth, however, makes a different decision. And it's a decision that doesn't make sense. I want you to pause and think for yourself for a moment. If you were in this situation, your family's having to move, but you have an opportunity to stay back where you have a better chance of success, of finding uh, provision, of getting yourself taken care of, 
if you were to stay where you are and not travel with your family, would you go? Imagine most of us would, might say yes, of course, but if we're thinking you have a chance of life, a greater chance of life, or a greater chance of death, well, most of us, you know, if, if sin is not present, would probably choose the greater chance of life. I would, I'll be honest. I would choose the greater chance of life. Yet, Ruth doesn't. Verse 16, this is probably one of the most, one of the other most recognizable. There's, there's a few texts in Scripture that everyone knows. This is one of them. Naomi, 15, look, Naomi said, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Naomi's response to this is silence, at least as far as the narrator is concerned. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. But think about that. Naomi has just declared in her second speech to leave that I have nothing. In fact, God is against me. God himself, the Lord, is against me. Go home. And Ruth says, no, I won't. And picture just tears running down her face. She's clinging to her mother-in-law, begging, do not send me away from you. You are where I want to be. I know this is right. I'm going to stay. And I'm not going to leave. Notice that Ruth does not also paint an optimistic portrayal of the future. She doesn't say, where you prosper, I will prosper. Come rich or poor, we're going to be together. Where you die... I will die, and there I will be buried. And may God punish me severely if death separates us. Ruth also shares a bleak, depressed view of the future. She is not any more optimistic than Naomi. This is a terrible decision. She knows it. She's not going to leave Naomi. Ruth's not going to do it. This is a beautiful picture of love. And it's in a passage where the word love doesn't come up. In fact, the word love in Ruth will not come up until chapter 4. It will not come up once in the book of Ruth until chapter 4. Yet, love is all over the place. Love is in Ruth's voice, tone, body language, picture this young woman begging her mother-in-law to stay with her, to live with her, to come home with her, even if it means nothing. Even if it means there's no hope, there's no future, I would rather be with you than anywhere else. The author continues, verse 19, so the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the woman explained, can this be Naomi? There's a, there's a shock. She's been gone for 10 years. She's fine. She's alive. Okay. Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara. Mara means bitter. She's changed her name. Call me Mara because the Almighty, God Almighty, has dealt bitterly with me. He has made my life very bitter. I went away full, husband and two sons, but I have come home empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. My life has no meaning. I have no hope for the future. Change my name. I'm not Naomi. I am bitter. And that is all my life is, and that's all it will be. Have you ever been in that situation where in the deepest, darkest moments of your life, you can't help but want to say, why, why God? 
have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me? It was on the lips of Jesus as he hung on the cross. Why, God, have you not done what you have always said you will do? Why are you not providing for me? Naomi, to her friends, will now open her very broken, bitter heart, her hurting, suffering heart. Call me Mara. Call me bitter. Because God himself, the Almighty, Shaddai, which is the word Almighty in Hebrew, he has made my life bitter. It is God's fault that I am here. It is God's fault that I have come home with nothing. It is God's fault. Have you ever been there? Have you ever thought those things? One of my favorite psalms, Psalm 13. If you want to flip there and read that with me, go ahead. Psalm 13 opens with this kind of a question. And you can just transpose this on Naomi. I'll give you just a moment longer to get there. Psalm 13, starting in verse 1. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say to me, I have overcome him. My foes will rejoice when I fall. Psalm 13 continues on. In a pivot, a turn, in an almost determined life, but I will choose to remain faithful. But for Mara, you have to stop at the end of verse 4. Mara would not have read or prayed verse 5 or 6. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. She would never have said that. Not now. Call me Mara. Because God has forgotten me. Because God, he's not even just forgotten me. He has intentionally made my life worse. Have you been there? Do you know someone who's been there? I have been there. A moment of loneliness and isolation, wondering why God was making me work at Pizza Hut and Panera Bread. I've talked about this. When all I wanted to do was teach the Bible, why, God, are you leaving me here to suffer? Why am I alone? Why am I suffering? And that is just for me. You may have something even darker. Maybe a past church has hurt you deeply or a family friend or a family themselves. Maybe you've been chewed up and spit out by the world. Circumstances and life happenings that don't make sense have caused great pain and suffering. Maybe it's sickness. Maybe it's a broken body. What is it for you that makes you want to say, God, why have you punished me so What have I done to deserve this? Why have you afflicted me? Chapter 1 will not leave from this point. Verse 22, back in Ruth chapter 1. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem. The barley harvest was beginning. Naomi doesn't realize it. But that last statement arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning, is the light at the end of the tunnel, but Naomi can't see it. Naomi can't see it. I titled today's message, Love Leads to Healing Great Pain, because of where this story goes. Ruth's decision to not leave Naomi leads to, just happens to lead to, meeting Boaz, which we'll go over next week and what that means or two weeks from now, and what that means for Boaz the following week. And who Boaz is to Naomi. But for now, Naomi can't see a silver lining. There is no light at the end of the tunnel. There's no silver lining. There's nothing to look forward to. Everything is terrible and miserable. Except for one thing. And maybe she realizes it. The story doesn't tell us. 
but Ruth is with her. In an act of love, Ruth chose to stay even though the prospects of a positive future were bleak. Ruth chose to stay. And in Ruth choosing to stay, she has made the decision that God will use to provide for her, provide for Naomi, and provide for the entire world hope and peace and healing. But they don't see this. They don't know this right now. But God's provision here is not divine. It is not supernatural. Well, it is divine, but it's not supernatural. It's ordinary. And while Ruth makes an extraordinary decision that none of us, that makes sense to no one, if we're thinking in terms of humans, in terms of our broken, sinful nature, Ruth makes this decision that God will use to provide for Ruth, for Naomi, and for the world. And that's what we learn about God. That sometimes the ordinary, boring, normal means that God chooses to provide sometimes comes through a kind word, a warm hug, a hand on the shoulder, a, a phone call. Sometimes you don't even know. If you've ever been there where you have just been sad and hurting and just someone just called or they just showed up and it just they had no idea. But somehow they just knew to go. They knew to come or they just happened to buy. It could even be boring, like, oh, I was just driving by and I came in, or, you know, I just was, wanted to talk to you about getting together next week. But you needed that voice, that kindness, that, that warmth of another human in that moment. That is God providing. As we see here in Ruth, it is in the ordinary, boring, human means that God often chooses to show up. The Bible is full of the extraordinary, supernatural means God parting the Red Sea, God delivering quail, God keeping his, raising his son from the dead. Yet, God here chooses to use normal, unassuming Ruth, a Moabite, a foreigner, not even his chosen people, to be such a rich blessing to Naomi and to Boaz as we'll find out. And so I always challenge us, and I've talked about this all the time, but in light of this, when I tell you to go and carry each other's burdens, to support one another, to love one another, understand that that could be, probably is, in fact, most likely, is God providing to the person whom you are talking by showing kindness, by acting out the fruit of the Spirit, by living according to the good works God has set aside for us to do. As we learned about in Ephesians chapter 2, God saved us for good works. And those good works are God providing for other people. So when you show kindness to a stranger, to your family member or friend, when you just call someone out of the blue, and you might not know it, but in that moment, you might be providing a huge blessing to them. In the actions and words, in the Bible, especially in Ruth, love is not an emotion. We think of love as an emotion in America, but in the Bible, love is an action. It is a determined decision to live life in a certain way that blesses other people. Ruth certainly had to have felt the emotional love for Naomi. She wouldn't have made the decision to stay with her if she hadn't. But Ruth loves Naomi in that she goes to Bethlehem, to a land of not her people, to be with her mother-in-law. That action, that decision, that movement forward. So when you love other people, not the emotion, but the action, through kind words, through forgiveness, through grace, through forgiving of debts, you are making an active effort to participate in God's work of redemption in the world. We don't have to save people. We don't have to be the one who has the conversation that God uses to save someone's soul, to save someone's soul. Maybe you're the person who planted the seed. Maybe you watered it. God will make it grow. 
And as long as we live according to how Christ called us to love one another as he has loved us, we are actively serving God whether we know it or not. And so go, this week, go, go, go. And know that if you are suffering, it's okay. You're not alone. Let's, as a church, be the church that is known as a a hospital for the sick, for the suffering, for the hurting, that we will come alongside and pray with each other and support one another and love one another, and that through our actions we will serve God, consciously or unconsciously. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you. Thank you for each other. Lord, we don't know it, but oftentimes we unwittingly serve you and showing kindness to others. And I pray that you would bring that to our minds more often. Encourage us with that thought that no matter how broken we feel, no matter how useless to you we feel, sometimes simply showing up and sitting with someone who needs company can be the greatest act of love that that person ever needs. So God, I ask that you would reveal to us the ways in which you use us, the ways in which we bless others, that we would be encouraged by that. God, for those who are hurting and suffering and alone and in our dark place where we want to blame you for our suffering, God, I pray for your patience and your forgiveness and your comfort. Lord, I ask that you would bring people like Ruth into our lives who would just declare that it doesn't matter what we go through, they will stand by our side. God, thank you for the gift and grace and love of your son, the ultimate result of Ruth's decision to stay with Naomi. Help us to see that this week and to see how we can care for other people. Thank you, Jesus. It is in your son's name that we pray. Amen.